Sorry, mate. Sorry, future James, for making you edit this. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth episode of Highlander, the show where we talk about every single legendary card in Hearthstone. I'm joined, as always, by my good friend and co-host, Jamie. How are you doing, Jamie? Good, thanks, James. Hi, everybody. I'm James, telling you to sit back and relax as we talk about more cards. Gruel, 8 mana, 7, 7. At the end of each turn, gain plus one, plus one. When I'm doing research on topics, I always like to ask myself questions and then do the research around those questions. And on Gruel, I wrote meme trash, question mark. And then 10 minutes later, after looking through the decks that he's been in, went, yep, definitely meme trash. In terms of playability, he's right, right towards the bottom. We've talked about cards that are just big piles of stats and that don't do anything when they impact the board. Like late getting cards and Grull is the biggest pile of stats doesn't do anything to impact the board card while that is all true i will just say one thing and that is at least you can use Grull in an actual deck maybe subpar or maybe suboptimally but at least you can use him unlike something like the beast or my exner there are two decks that immediately spring to mind when i'm thinking of ways to use Grull. both of them are wild decks obviously and the first is Jungle Giants Druid. Jungle Giants, what a card that is. So this is a deck which utilises the Ungoro Druid quest, which is Jungle Giants. Play five minions that have five or more attack, and your reward is Barnabas. Five mana, eight, eight, battle cry. The minions in your deck now cost zero. So the idea is that you jam in loads of greedy big minions and then play them for zero mana later on in the game. It's definitely a meme, but... It's good fun, and Gruul is actually not that bad if you have to play exactly zero mana for him. The other deck which springs to mind when I'm trying to think of ways to use Gruul is Bad Big Priest. And this is just Big Priest where you just chuck in whatever meme garbage you want, so Boulder Fist Ogres, Gruul most notably, like anything with a higher mana cost than like six, you know, and you just want to res it over and over again. And it's just terrible, but it's great fun. I'm reasonably, uh, reasonably experienced with Bad Big Priest. What a great deck. Used to run um, Gruul, Blood of the Ancient One, Hakar. Just run whatever meme trash that you can think of, really. But yeah, I mean, Gruul's a key component of that deck. Unfortunately, neither of these decks are particularly good, especially with Gruul in them. Blood of the Ancient One, Big Priest, is decent. I don't know what you mean. Oh yeah, one game sample size at rank floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, it was about five games. I think I went four and one. In casual or wild. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so there you go. And I beat you once as well with it. I remember it. I, Wait, what? We had a friendly match and I beat you. So I think that makes it six and one. Was this a fever dream? I don't remember this. I don't remember this. I got you with her car, mate. Oh, yes. I don't remember what I got. I can't... Yes, I remember this because Rastakhan's had just come out. Yeah, I remember now because we were just playing me in trash. Yeah, well. <laughs> oh, good good times. Yeah. I've got Gruel up on HS replay right now. Ooh, do go on. And he's in one deck, and that's, uh, that's Big Warrior with Dimensional Ripper. Now. That deck's actually not awful, and you can actually climb with it. Not with Gruel. He's actually got the highest played win rate in the deck, 49%. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. What a guy. This is a 290-game sample size. What a legend. What a legend. I know, what a guy. We could just stop the episode right here. That way <laughs> we've peaked. <laughs> Ysera, 9 mana 4, 12, legendary neutral dragon. At the end of your turn, add a dream card to your hand. We're not going to go into exactly what the dream cards are here, because it would take too long to explain, but I'll put a little graphic on YouTube. But for anyone listening who doesn't know, dream cards are basically extremely powerful cards. One of them, for example, is a 0 mana spell. Give a minion plus 5, plus 5. At the start of your next turn, destroy it. You know? It's that kind of thing. They're really powerful cards. Or at least they were. It's like a, an example of a good endgame card, right? Because it's hard to remove at 12 health, and it's guaranteed to give you a value by drawing a much better card than you can actually play in a deck. And then obviously if it sticks, it continues to generate value. So it's like 
can sign up a soft horn as well. As big cards go, it's quite good. It's kind of dropped off a lot recently because just playing big stuff isn't really the thing to do. Oh, I was hoping you were going to say that Ysera sees lots of playing standard. Ysera doesn't see a great deal of play these days, but it's fine. It's just off, I think. It's like the next best thing a lot of the time. Well, it used to be the case that back in the day, as a control warrior, you could drop this against a mid-range or another control deck, and if they couldn't clear Ysera in the space of a few turns, it would usually generate enough value for you to just go and win the game. Most of the cards, as well as being very efficient, are also just extremely powerful, and you could just drop them. So the one that returns minions to their hand, in particular, for gaining tempo, was very, very good. Yeah. You could low roll, because... There is one of them that is particularly worse than the other ones, and that one is Laughing Sister. The free mana free five can't be targeted. Laughing Sister isn't great, but everything else is excellent, obviously. I mean, even then, Laughing Sister is a great minion, and it would see playing decks now. It's a, it's a fantastic card, obviously, but it's just when you're considering the other cards that you could get off your Sarah, it is a bit of a low roll. Well, I know I get annoyed when I get Laughing Sister. The thing I'm trying to point out here is that your Sarah regardless of its synergies with other cards in your deck, it could just win games on its own because it was just that good of a value bomb when the game started, you see. Slower iterations of Dragon Priest used to run it, I think. But before Dragon Priest sped up, should I say. I think that was quite a common card because obviously it's synergistic with the dragons and it. It's good end game. Another deck that it saw playing quite a fair bit in Wild before either better minions were printed or the game sped up was Big Priest. So you would use your resurrection spells to resurrect your Sarah and other cards like the Lich King over and over again. Something interesting about the deck that anyone who's either played or played against that version will tell you is that the Lich King was quite clearly the stronger card out of those two. Those were the only minions you can summon, obviously, but they're very similar in function. And even though the Lich King cost one mana less, it was almost always better because of the fact that it has taunt. And the stat line is quite a bit more threatening than Ysera's. Yeah. Well, that's why the Lich King's so good, right? You can get away with running it in Big Shaman as well. Not that you particularly want to, but if you've got no better options, it's something you can play. This Big Shaman is obviously the wild version with Ancestor's Call. Now it's got Scrapyard Colossus, uh, Eureka, all these sort of things. Um, you know, in Rise of Shadows, there was that Muck Morpha Shaman running around. Would that run? Um, did that run Ysera, you know, in Standard? I remember playing it in mine, and I think quite a lot of people did as well. I think it was pretty commonly run. It being what we've said, it's something you can muck more for into, and then it'll draw you a card immediately. One deck that I can really strongly remember Ysera being played in, as like a key part of it, was Big Druid. And this was the version that was running around in Knights of the Frozen Throne. This deck I would consider something off meta, you may disagree, but... Ysera was a key part in that deck because it had a lot of dragon synergies and I believe it ran Deathwing Dragon Lord. My memory's a little hazy, but this was in the period between Knights of the Frozen Throne and Kobolds and Catagomes where the deck sort of changed a little bit. It wasn't super common on ladder, but it was very powerful. Like you say, sort of Frozen Throne until Kobolds came out. Ysera does come up off of the Dragon Lackey again, as as any dragon in the classic set does. I played Zoo a couple of days ago and I got Dragon Lackey and got Ysera off of it and won the game because of it. It's another one that's relevant occasionally. It's like a tag. You're not putting it in your deck. I can't believe you're sat here and telling me that Ysera is Deathwing or Anixia tier where it's just something good to get off Dragon Lackey. Like, I, I, just, I just can't believe we've reached this point where it's like, it's an RNG card and it's, you know, good to find off of random effects, but I believe you, it's it's true. Well yeah, it's 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 borderline playable. <laughs> See, unlike some of the other cards that we've discussed on the podcast, I don't really think that you need to look at changing your Sarah. There are much, much more deserving cards that need either buffs or reworks. It has a niche, probably in a different meta, but that niche is there and I don't think it needs changing. Yeah, we'll see, won't we? I don't think it really needs addressing to the extent of some of them. Okay, six mana, four, four. At the end of your turn, summon a two, two token with taunt. Two, two, null. Yeah, it's... Oh, boy. 
I think this is the worst card in the classic set. Really? Worst card? What about Millhouse, dude? Come on. Yeah, but like we said in episode one, at least Millhouse had like a little bit of play. I mean, if you can count that. Oh, come on. Are you talking like the whole set or just legendaries? No, no, like the whole set, the whole set, like every card. No, I think there's some worse commons than it in epics. Right, but just think about legendaries for the moment. I absolutely think that this is... Also, I think the beast's worse than Hogger. <sighs> uh, I can't agree. <laughs> no, nah, Hogger's really good off of power of creation. Honestly, you, there's not much to choose from, and he's really good. Hmm, I can see that, I can see that. Yeah, that makes sense. I can't think of a single blooming deck that anyone has ever played Hogger in, and I have, I have bloody tried to find one. I swear, I have tried to find people actually either discussing the viability of Hogger in a positive way, or just putting him in some meme deck at the very least. But no, there is absolutely no out there on the barren wasteland of the internet. There is just nothing there about bloody Hogger. And you know what? I'm going to say something and you're not going to like it. I think that Morose is a better card. Excuse me. It is, it's... <laughs> right, come on then. Come on. Really? Yeah. I mean, I like Morose. You know I like Morose, but I can't, I can't back oh, it. Right, just cut. Cool, right. right, so there was literally a deck created for Morose. That's this Quest Rogue. And it got cut from Quest Rogue within about two days of the deck coming out. Like, If, if that doesn't say something about that card, I don't know what it does really. Yeah, but my counterpoint, and I don't think you can beat this, is that at least he had a bloody deck. At least Morose had a deck that people even considered putting him in and thought, hey, this is going to be good. Hogger has never had that. Hogger has always been terrible. Absolutely terrible. Oh, I found a worse card, by the way. Oh, go on. It's one of the new epics they added. Oh, no. <laughs> Baron Stable Hand. Oh, no. <laughs> it's a 7 man at 4 4 epic. Battle Cry Summon a Random Beast. Now, you're trying to tell me that that's not worse than Hogger. Okay, right. <laughs> I don't disagree. Right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a card I always forget exists. What about Brightwing's rarer cousin, High Inquisitor White, mate? Do you know, that's that's dicey. I have a golden copy of that card and I've never played it. Oh, no, I'm gonna be honest, I was not <laughs> I was not happy with it. I was not happy opening a golden copy of that. The only reason that I can assume Blizzard keeps Hogger the way it is, is because it teaches players what a bad card looks like, or rather, what a win more card looks like. Aside from the Beast, which we've already covered, there are two other examples of really stupid win more cards in the classic set of Legendaries. Hogger is one of them, and the other one we will get to in the next episode, but Hogger only helps you if you are already ahead on board, because you can't really trade with the Hogger body because you want to protect it, because otherwise it doesn't generate you any value. So you have to be winning. And if your strategy is already be winning, to play what is not even that good doesn't generate that much value, it's just, it's just awful, that's all. So if you want to put Hogger in your deck, just win. Just already be ahead. Yeah, just win, just win for her. That's it, that's exactly right, that's exactly right, you know. I found another card that's worse than Hogger, by the way, in the classic set. If only the end of it's another one of the new ones, it's Arcane Devourer. It's an 8 mana, 5, 5 elemental, rare. Whenever you cast a spell, gain plus 2, plus 2. Oh, that's the one I was thinking of like a few minutes ago. Yeah, that's that is. <sighs> now that's a bad card. That's got to be one of the worst cards ever printed, right? Surely. We have gone so far off track. Oh my goodness. This is supposed to be about Hogger, right? <sighs> I'm just going to calm down. Anyway, I think we've covered Hogger. Let's move on before my blood boils over. Right, and now to talk about a card I actually like. Harrison Jones. 5 mana, 5, 4. Battle cry. Destroy your opponent's weapon and then draw cards equal to its durability. It's a good card, really. It's just a high-quality tech card, really. It's, uh, it's very, very effective at what it does. It gives you a nice option for weapon removal. It's just good. This card is perfectly suited to the classic set. Alongside Acidic Swamp Ooze, it's the neutral weapon removal that is essential for a healthy meta. I don't think it sees as much play as 
acidic swamp ooze or in wild it's got its cousin in gluttonous ooze but Harrison has a place he's good at what he does and he's not overpowered or underpowered actually he's just a perfectly fine tech card in the classic set and that's good and it's healthy for the game it also gives you the option that if you're playing like a Highlander deck you can run both oh so like both Ooze and Harrison. Okay, I got you. Yeah, there's a lot of Highlander decks right now. So Harrison sees a lot of play at the moment because of Zephyrus the Great, and he has a habit of giving you Harrison whenever the opponent has a weapon. And a lot of people have a habit of also picking Harrison when maybe they shouldn't be picking him. For example, when they're going to overdraw. So there I was a couple of seasons ago yeah. playing against a Raza Priest, and this is my boss fight to get to Legend. I'm playing my absolute favourite deck, Dead Man's Hand Warrior, right? So, I believe it's turn eight, I've just played Scourge Lord Garrosh, which is a hero card, and it gives you a four free weapon, right? What happened was, my opponent played Zeph, it gave him Harrison, he played Harrison, and then he ended his turn. Now, this is something that you should never do against Dead Man's Hand Warrior. As a combo deck, when you rely on drawing your combo pieces to beat the deck, and that is, he left this turn with a full <laughs> hand. So what do I do? I do Bran Bronzebeard, Cold Light Oracle, Cold Light Oracle, and then what do I mill? I mill Shadow Reaper Anduin and Rise of the Chained. <laughs> and that's a concede on the spot, and that is me getting legend. <laughs> so <laughs> right, That is good effort. I mean, getting both of them, that's... Poor guy. Poor guy. Harrison is nearly, nearly, nearly always played as a tech, right? And it's rare that you can actually give your opponent a weapon to actually use Harrison on. But there are moments when you can do so. Now, the most consistent and viable way of doing this that people did for quite a long time was when Boomstay was in standard. Control Warriors were using Weapons Project and then Harrison Jones. Weapons Project gives your opponent a 2 free weapon and 6 armor. And it also gives you the same, but you play Harrison, destroys their weapon, and you draw 3 cards. That's a 7 mana combo with 2 cards, and like I say, it gives you some armor and a weapon to swing with, as well as all these cards and a body on board. It was really good. And as far as I'm aware, that saw quite a bit of play. And it's not even a meme, it's like a pretty bloody good combo. I think it's very well balanced. It's started fair enough that it's playable. You can temper it out and it's not awful. It's not good like a 5 4 is worth about 3 mana, maybe. 3 and a half, I suppose. It's not like good. But if it's a control mirror and it's a dead card, you can just play it and it's reasonable. I think the thing with it in Wild is that there's enough card draw in Wild that the card draw is not super important and you generally need the defense if you were removing a weapon. So Glisten of Suze, which gains armor, is almost always better. The other thing about Harrison in Wild is that he comes down on five instead of two or three like the other viable oozes. And the problem with that is the fact that that's too late. I need to kill their anchor the turn it comes down. You know, like... A turn later or two turns later is not good enough. And especially because of the fact that Harrison is just kind of slow and wild. Like, turn five, do nothing except destroy their weapon. It's just not good enough because Pirate Warrior will just kill you with their pirates. And Kingsbane Rogue will just smack you with their pirates. I'm beginning to notice a theme here. But anyway, the point is that it's a bit slow and wild. But that's fine. You know, wild is degenerate garbage anyway. And that's why I love it. But, you know, it is what it is. Law Walker Cho, 2 mana, 0, 4, legendary neutral minion, whenever a player casts a spell, put a copy into the other player's hands. Well, I mean, this is an interesting card, shall we put it that way? For my money, Law Walker does exactly what I think a legendary neutral minion in the classic set should do, and that is provide interesting deck building challenges, none of which are particularly overpowered, especially in Law Walker's case, but... He does provide you that interesting deck building option and it's good that something like this remains evergreen so people can meme forever. Unlike some other much more boring cards. <laughs> you really hate Hogger, don't you? Well, it's just a... It's just... It's just a waste. I just didn't realise, because it's normally me that has, like, hatreds of cards, right? You know, specific, you know, like, green skin and... and things like that right it's, well, it's just well in my opinion the worst thing a car can do is be so completely boring and forgettable 
Oh, yeah, I agree. You know how much I hate boring cards. There's actually stuff to talk about with Joe, though, so let's, let's talk about it. Agreed. Uh, do you want to start? Right, so I've got Law Walker Joe up on HS Replay. Okay. And there's, um, <laughs> there's two deck lists that are running him. Right. Which are both Zoom Warlock with uh, Org Merchant Fiendish Serpent to buff its attack. Hmm. Between the two of them, they have about a thousand games. Whoa. One of them has 47% win rate and the other has 46 So they're not good. No, but they're also not... But they're not terrible. They're not like horrific right yeah I've, I've seen far far worse meme decks than those that's the thing it's not a meme deck it's just a deck with well to be fair one of them's got pago in as well that's got 710 games ah uh. and like <laughs> whichever 710 people have done this <laughs> like well done to you oh no i'll tell you why it's because of scrap him oh okay i see yeah yeah cho with scrap him becomes a two five that's value that is well, it's just so threatening. You can't clear it because then the opponent will get AoE in their hand. <laughs> it's a big threat. It's a wonder people haven't caught on to this Meta Breaker deck. There is actually a deck out there which uses Cho, and although I really strongly disagree with him, the deck creator swears by this card being a core part of the deck, right? And you can read his post on the competitive subreddit, and it's very interesting. He wrote a very, very detailed deck guide on Standard Labour and Paladin, and now... His weird card that he put in was Law Walk Cho. And his reasoning for this, and he swears by it and he defends it, is if you're up against a control deck and you play lots of Librims of Wisdom, you can effectively force the opponent to overdraw. Blizzard has tried to get rid of ways to interfere with the opponent's hand by removing Cold Light Oracle and Naturalize and these sort of things. But Law Walker can still do it. Now, if you can just spam loads of cards at zero mana for you and an absolute pain in the ass for your opponent to get rid of fantastic now this is a very 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 strong and weird tech against control decks like really really greedy control decks and causing them to overdraw and have like limited hand space but i just think it's just so funny i think it's great and uh it's actually sort of decent you know i don't i don't know what to say like it's okay that's interesting that actually sounds vaguely plausible as a deck to put him in Right, yeah. It sounds like if someone wanted to make a competitive deck, that's what you do. Yeah, well, I don't know. I may have to try it. Was this in, was this in wild, I presume? No, no, no. This is in oh, standard. standard. It's in standard. Well, I'll, I'll look into that then. Yeah, yeah. I didn't actually see that post. I'll investigate it. So aside from that borderline competitive usage, have you got any more places people have actually used them? I don't usually use Hearthstone, but considering we're going for highly competitive cards, I thought I'd just check show out and see what's going on. And literally, I think all the decks are just like deliberate mean garbage. Like we have Purify 99.7 win rate Fast Legend from 2016. <laughs> and um, so the guides are pretty great. The Mulligan guide purifies the only keep in the deck. And versus Agro, Mulligan for Molten Giant and Bolf Ram Shield combo. Or brush his face with Wiss. <laughs> This is a prime example of the sort of thing that the card is used for. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it used to be a 1 4 for a bit. Oh, really? Okay, that's interesting. Too good, apparently. With Ashes of Outlands coming out, there was a brand new Wild Mage OTK that relies on Law Walker Cho to actually do it. So, what you do is you play Law Walker and then you play Mirror Entity, the secret that summons a copy of whatever minion in your opponent just played. You do this and a more oops and you hope that the opponent then goes and plays Mirror Entity because they don't know what you're doing. Once the secret is online on their side of the field, then you play the 1 mana 1-4 one from Ashes of Outlands. I can't remember what it's called. It's the one that's got the Wrath Guard effect where if this minion takes damage, you also take that damage, but it's an overstated minion. I can't remember what it's called. Soulbound Dash Tongue. Or something like that. Soulbound, something, something like that. I don't know. And then you play the other minion from Ashton of Outlands that doubles all damage minions take from spells. Oh, Moag Artificer, I think. And then you play Meteor, which deals 15 damage to a minion for six mana. And then that's a stupid OTK that does 30 damage to the opponent. Now, obviously, this is complete hot meme garbage, but it's really weird to see an OTK that completely relies on your opponent doing something. 
Fun meme. Alakir, the Windlord. Eight mana, three, five, Shaman Legendary. I get ready for this. Divine Shield, Wind Fury, Charge, and Taunt. Oh, and he's an elemental. I don't think many people would disagree with me if I said Alakir was one of, if not the weakest, class legendary in the classic set, right? I think it's a toss-up between Cenarius, Alakir, and Jaraxxus. Jaraxxus has been terrible for, like, the last three years or something. But he was good enough earlier on. I'll, I'll let him off. I feel like it's always good to start these discussions at the start of the game or when the cards were first released. Now, with Alakir, Shaman was not really a popular class for a while. And it's safe to say that Alakir doesn't see a great deal of play the problem with saying this is that I wasn't really playing back then. It's only like reading retrospectively that I can look at this sort of thing. So do you think Alakir saw lots of play back in Classic? Or are you kind of like me where you don't really think that he did? Because I know you weren't really playing them, but I just want to get another person's perspective. Do you know, I honestly don't know either. I know this is a deck that you've played a fair amount of, but I know Alakir was really good in Mukamorpha Shaman in Standard. So this is a Standard deck that came out with around Rise of Shadows and revolved around using Mukamorpha and abusing it. So this is a 5-mana 4-4 minion that transforms into a 4-4 copy of a random minion in your deck that isn't named Mukamorpha. You get 5-mana 4-4 Alakir or Walking Fountain or something like that. It's like Big Shaman in Standard. He was pretty good, actually. I, I, he was one of the ones that I liked getting just because, like, his immediate stats and immediately hits for eight, right? When you think about it, it's like more for turning into Alakir. It's like a 4-4, so four, four, which is similar stats. It's more attacks than the actual card. So. Something that's a little bit of a tragedy is that Big Shaman has actually existed in Wild for quite a long time. It's only now that it's really become a meta deck in its own right. And historically, it would always run Alakir as just a good 8-drop to cheat out. But unfortunately, it's just been outclassed by a lot of new cards. The best iteration of Big Shaman, from my experience, and the one that I've played, is, is the one that runs Walking Fountains, Scrapyard Colossus, and then Big Colossus, Colossus and Moon. There's too much competition for it, really. Just because you're a more rounded player than I am and play both formats a fair bit, what other meta decks can you think of that Alakir has been like quite a key part in? Well, I think the main deck that he saw playing was Even Shaman in Standard. It was like the most underrated deck, I think. It was tier one a lot in that year. But I remember in particular well, there was a um like a tavern brawler seam and I and I kept doing it with Even Shaman and I like what twelve wins like three times in a row with the deck or something. And Alakir was really good in that deck because of Flame Totem Totem. Oh, right. So basically, 10 damage to face. Yeah, it was your finisher, right? I mean, standard even Shaman was like very mid rangey. They had like fire elementals and it was quite heavy. Top end. Run Lich King as well. It's funny because I seem to recall a few even Shaman lists when the Witchwood came out using Alakir, actually, in Wild as well as, like you say, the Lich King. And I think some of them ran Ragnaros, you know, instead of Lich King or something like that. But anyway, it was like a mid-range version. But the deck obviously now is very, very different to how it was in Standard. Now it's a complete aggro deck focused on abusing Splitting Axe, Totemic Surge, and whichever one gives attack, you know, the zero mana buff to create a massive board of totems. And it doesn't try to get to turn eight. It tries to win well before then. So unfortunately, until that deck slows down somewhat, and I don't think it will, Alakir really doesn't have a place in that deck anymore. But it was very good in standard. I'll tell you what, here's a question for you. If Mugmorpha Shaman was to make a comeback in standard, because obviously Mugmorpha's still there, do you reckon it would play Alakir or not? And obviously, this is assuming that Shaman makes some sort of miraculous comeback. Yeah, well, that's it, right? Like, I think that's about as close as it's going to get. But as you say, the problem there is that you have to play Shaman. Scout your classes, classes of the moon. There's a lot. It's like most of the stuff that's in Wild, actually. That's all all about, to be honest. Yeah. Nah, maybe it won't see play then. Oh. It's interesting what you say, though, about Flame Tongue, because. The one thing that Alakir does have that a lot of other cards don't have is Charge and Wind Fury, which means that the card scales incredibly well. If 
there is ever a way to buff Alakir's attack consistently and possibly cheaply, Alakir looks to be a really, really big threat in the future, right? It's a powerful burst card, so if there's a deck that wants a burst card, it might see play in that. It's one of those that sort of hovers around, and I think it'll be useful at some point. I think the real big issue for it is Flame Tongue being nerfed, because that was obviously the best synergy with it. Right, just in case someone from Blizzard is listening to this, I would much rather have Alakir be a completely unplayable card than have Flame Tongue Totem back in its broken, broken state. <laughs> we can't have that again. Well, I used to call it Flame Tongue Broken for a long time, <sighs> so... You know, remember that. I still think it's really powerful when it just pops up off of random effects. I still think bloody Nora, this card was at two. This card was at two. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how could they get away with that? Yeah, I would be willing to bet that at some point in the future, someone is going to develop some really stupid, consistent combo of Alakia, and the cards will be printed to allow for it. It doesn't take that much of a buff to get Alakia to stupid levels. I've got a couple of other things to say about Alakia, so. He's very good off of Spiteful Summon, or if you go for an 8 drop. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. You know, I have, to, I have to throw that in there. But also, there was an Elemental Shaman, a really weird Elemental Shaman that was around in the back end of Rastakhan that was like a okay. super RNG generation and then used that hand in discount at the one that's like galvanizer for elementals. Okay, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, so it just ran like a bunch of elementals and tried to just discount them with like Grumble and then go like mental with Calamus and Shudder and Blaze Caller and stuff like that. That deck is in kind of insane. Okay, that sounds cool. It was quite playable on ladder. It was pretty successful, but it was weird and Alakia was I don't know if you actually ran him but he was good off of the 100 RNG generations you used to play you often got an Alakia and then discount him a bit or grumble him and that's value right well it could be good as like just six burst right um, someone did a really similar thing to me the other day with Grumble, where they got some stupid combo off the quest Grumble and that new 5 mana 5 5 that deals 5 damage if you're overloaded. Yeah, Kima the Maximus. That card's going to be broken at some point, I swear. Like, I'll be really surprised if it doesn't cause some issues in the future, because it's too easy to activate it. Just to wrap off the discussion about Alakir, I think we've got pretty similar thoughts on it, really. It's just like a kind of an underwhelming class of legendary, but it's had its moment in Even Shaman in Standard. It's had a little bit of a resurgence in Muck Morpha Shaman, again, in Standard. And there's always that potential there for it to be used in some sort of burst combo. Yeah. I think it'll happen at some point. I think at some stage we're going to get the cards to make that combo happen. But as it stands right now, kind of an underwhelming card. Lord Jaraxxus, 9 mana, 315, Demon, Warlock, Legendary, Battle Cry. Destroy your hero and replace him with Lord Jaraxxus. This card routinely tops people's favourite cards or most well-designed cards list of all time. And there's a good reason for that, right? He's the original Death Knight. He's one of the coolest cards in the game, always had these sick voice lines. Everyone loves Vita Jaraxxus. Yeah, I mean, lots to unpack about it, really. So we should probably explain what Jaraxxus actually does when it says destroy your hero. And what that means is... Your hero from that point in the game is replaced with Jaraxxus, who is a 15 health hero, which means that your health can't actually go over 15 without armor or the priest quest reward or something like that. The other thing is that your hero power becomes replaced with two mana, summon a 6-6, and you also become equipped with a free attack, eight durability weapon. Often when you are Jaraxxus, you just hit your opponent's face every turn with a weapon, which is 24 over the course of the weapon's durability, which makes it like one attack from one of your hero power minions and the weapon's attacks 30. I've not played Jaraxxus in a long time. He's just not good enough, really. It's like the Warlock Galacron is just better than Jaraxxus. It gives you a bit of a board. Your hero power is obviously it's, it's worse, and your weapon is worse if it's invoked, but it's just, it's the health. It's all the health. 
And also there's the fact that Jurassic has cost nine mana, which is, as I've spoken about before, is a terrible mana cost for pretty much any card. Historically speaking, Jaraxxus is pretty much synonymous with Handlock, one of the original powerhouse decks in Hearthstone. This is a Warlock deck that focused around summoning Molten Giants when your health became quite low and Mountain Giants. Jaraxxus would frequently be played in that deck as a late game value bomb and also a way to restore your health back up and there also wasn't much capability for your opponent to burn you down from that point basically if you're the warlock and playing jaraxxus and you're just hitting the hero power every turn which you probably should be you're just going to outvalue nearly every single deck he had a bit of a resurgence when mean streets of gadget sand came out because it made reno warlock into a, an actually good deck Jaraxxus was quite good in that deck as just a great win condition value generator you know a two mana six six every turn was still really really good Unfortunately, when Reno Jackson and a bunch of other great Warlock cards rotated or were Hall of Famed, Jaraxxus and Gul'dan had a bit of a problem. This is after the Ungoro meta, and that was a meta where every class had a tier 1 or 2 deck except for Warlock, which the highest deck was tier 5, I think. Frozen Throne was much better because it introduced things like Defile and Despicable Dreadlord, which were all excellent cards that helped the class a lot. Kind of a similar situation to the Shaman now, where it's like they were good cards, but the deck still hadn't found its feet. And it was tier three at best. And I think that's probably a bit generous, to be honest, Control War along. It's interesting how it wasn't actually the release of Knights of Frozen Throne that spelt the end for Jaraxxus, because Gul'dan wasn't strictly a better choice at this point. You've got to remember that there weren't really any big demons that Gul'dan was going to resurrect, you know? You had Despicable Dreadlord, like Jamie said, but there wasn't really much else. Because this was before Mana Cheat, Mana Cheat, the expansion was released. We seem to mention Cobalt and Catacombs quite a lot. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, that expansion did put the nail in the coffin for Jaraxxus because now you had Skull of the Minari, you had Void Lord a big minion that was worth resurrecting. It was just no contest, really. I mean, we say this every time we bring it up, but once again, it is the most powerful expansion ever. I think it's the best expansion for any class, surely. I think I think the Warlock class cards in Cobalt beat every other one, except for maybe the Hunter class cards in Cobalt. Yeah, Druid, though. Druid. Nah, but... Um, but I think anyway. Anyway, this is irrelevant. This is irrelevant. It's it's irrelevant. It is you're completely right. It is irrelevant, in <laughs> fact. But suffice it to say that Knights of the Frozen Throne was the very last time that Jaraxxus was used. Until we get to Rise of Shadows. It's not that anything in Rise of Shadows was released that would make Jaraxxus more viable. It was more the fact that Gul'dan and Cobalt and Catacombs was rotating. A lot of people thought that maybe this would be Jaraxxus' time to shine. After all, 2 mana 6-6, six, six, got a weapon that deals quite a lot of damage. Maybe this is the time to make a comeback, especially because there are no other hero cards but it didn't really work out that way. That was far too fast for a Jaraxxus. I was just going to mention the main reason Jaraxxus hasn't been played since summer last year, which is a certain uh, interaction between Jaraxxus and Sacrificial Pact. So Sacrificial Pact used to say, destroy a demon, gain five health. Now, for whatever reason, Blizzard made it so that you could destroy the Jaraxxus hero with Sacrificial Pact. It was a funny interaction for a while. Then Zephyrus the Great came out, which then wished for a perfect card. And if your opponent was Juraxis, it would always give you sacrificial pact, and then you'd just be able to kill them. And there's a lot of decks that play them. The problem really is that Control Warlock isn't very good at the moment. And if Control Warlock was good, it wouldn't be running Juraxis anyway, because of the Galakron stuff, as I mentioned. It's just a better late game. The only slow Warlock that really exists is plot twist warlock and that has Malagos as a burn wing condition as we've discussed before so it's it's not relevant in the meta we're past that point other deck late game strategies are just better than him and they can out pressure and out value him far too easily for him to actually be relevant assuming that the game isn't going to slow down anytime soon what can we do to make Jaraxxus actually playable in a deck again Make it five mana. There you go. It's C play there. Right. Roll credits. At least make it eight mana so you can hero power on the same turn. That That's like the minimum. 
I think if they made it so that it turned your health into 15 but still kept you at 30, it would be much more useful. I feel like there's a conflict here between you want a class legendary to be good and you want Lord Jaraxxus to have the best flavour it can. And for my money, it's worth the sacrifice of a bit of flavour to make the card more playable by changing the way the health cap works. You know, that would that would help quite a lot, especially with how prevalent healing is now in Hearthstone. I think that would be quite good. You're looking at a much more playable card, but realistically, I don't think that's massively likely. I mean, not likely, but I think it's a much better, more viable card that isn't completely broken. It's funny because there's kind of a contradiction in Jaraxxus' design where he's a minion that wants to close out the game and yet his weapon takes so long to actually kill an opponent. Eight turns is a lot longer than it should be. What if it was an 8-3? <laughs> no, 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 no. 24-1. You've done it. We've done it. We've balanced it. Final card, everybody. Gromash Hellscream, or Grom, as we'll probably end up calling him. Warrior, legendary minion, 8 mana, 4, 9. And the text reads as following. Charge. When this minion is damaged, gain plus 6 attack. RIP in rage. Well, I think it's fair to call this a very powerful class legendary and control warrior staple. What do you think? I would argue just warrior staple. That works too. That works too. It's just charge is a good keyword for pushing damage. I've always considered Grom and Alakir to be very similar cards, obviously because they're both eight mana classic class legendaries that have charge on them. And also both kind of require outside help to be really good. But whereas Alakir has never really gotten the support it needs to become this all-powerful, threatening charge finisher, Grom Ash has always had that. Since the game released, there have always been cards, whether it's Whirlwind or Inner Rage, to combo with it. It's gotten more tools over time, like Bloodsworn Mercenary, Emperor Thorison, all this sort of stuff, but the basic tools to do this have always been there. It's just famous for being one of the best finishers in game. It's just fantastic at what it does. If you can get any sort of enrage effect on it, that's 10 charge damage and 10 burst in warrior is powerful. For a deck with few other ways of dealing direct damage, like within the class in terms of non-minions, just like having a big 10 attack guy on a stick, I like 12 attack if you use inner rage, as you often do. Sort of, as you say, control warrior run him. I remember Agro Warrior a lot of the time. I can save his of all doing when that deck was really powerful. That deck ran Gromash just as a top end card. He doesn't see as much play in Wild, but Wild Patron Warrior does frequently run him. So that's using Emperor Forreston, Blood Swan Mercenary, and then you obviously include all of the self damage effects already, like in a Rage, Brisky Skipper, you've maybe got Rampage as well. All of these cards are really good that also serve to activate your combo with Grom. I think the thing about it is that I don't think it's too powerful though, like at eight mana and requiring a second activator to immediately do its 10 charge damage. I think it's pretty fair in what it does because it's not just like a Leroy, for example, where it's just free damage and there's no sort of setup required. It's not like what we said about Van Cleef in the previous episode, where although you do get rewarded for putting good cards in the deck that you may want to play anyway, the warrior cards that used to empower Grom are aren't quite as versatile and you do always have to be thinking right what's my combo going to be or am i going to combo in this game or do i need to use blood swan on something else do i need to use inner rage here i think it's perfectly fine i think most people would agree with that as well it's just an iconic part of warrior mind you it's not always been played there were periods where it didn't see as much play like i seem to recall in the start of last year i don't think many standard decks ran him right when it was like Doctor Boom sort of era with all the mechs and Omega Devastator and all that stuff, Dynamatic, I'm fairly sure Grom didn't used to be played in that deck. At least I don't remember it being. We just had a better win condition. It was just outvalue with Hero Power and Omega Assembly and all that sort of thing. Like that was the powerhouse driving Control Warrior, not some big combo finisher. Yeah. But you certainly shouldn't take that as a indictment from us on the card's power level because... In this year, so far, Grom has been run in nearly every warrior list as a fantastic finisher. Some people don't run him, actually, which I find odd. As do I. The thing is, is that it's like a tech card, right? But 
I think it's generally perceived by people who are knowledgeable about the way the meta is that he's a tech card that you just should run because he's like very good against like Priest, which is one of the weaker matchups for the deck. Well, that's just it. The thing I was going to say is that I don't remember seeing Grom for a while until Agro Warrior came out in Saviors of All Do. And the main reason he's so good in that deck is because that deck brought in a Rage Rampage back to the fore. Oh, okay. This isn't. I don't know this. It never used to be particularly viable, but Blood Song Mercenary being able to copy a damage minion for three meant that you could just play these cards and they'd be good with the rest of your deck. And then you could run Grom so you could interarrange it and just burn for 12. Nice finisher option to have if you gassed out. I mean, this is what we mean about Warrior having these tools easily accessible as is in comparison to something like Shaman, where it's just never had the ability to buff Alakir or yeah. synergize well enough with it that it actually becomes a threat you have to sort of consider. Do you remember seeing Dane's list when the wild invasion happened uh, back in the last year? I do. Because that ran Forrison and Bloodsworn Mercenary, and I think that deck looked like so much fun. I wasn't really playing the game as much at that point, but I, was, I thought, wow, I should play this. Were you playing a lot at that point? I mean, it was a lot of his old charm, to be honest. Ah. Uh, it was a lot of his old charm. That's, uh, <laughs> that's understandable. That's the impression I got from uh, from Reddit. Outside of Patron Warrior, Grom doesn't really see too much play in Wild at the moment. Dead Man's Hand doesn't really have a consistent combo to do with him, and it prefers its own mill fatigue plan or generating infinite and offs or something along those lines. And... Odd Warrior obviously can't run him. You know, it prefers just to press the button every turn. And then sometimes they play Dr. Boom and they press a different button. Just the thought of Odd Warrior even now makes me, uh, makes me feel ill. You still hit that deck. I did once try playing it, you know. I even put, like, cubes and stuff in and tried to make it interesting. I played about three games and then deleted the deck. Quality. 